very good morning everybody so today's lecture is on pre and postnatal growth of the mandible and at the end of the lecture you must be able to know the various methods of bone growth pre and postnatal growth of mandible the different theories of growth in relation to mandible and its clinical application so we start with various methods of growing bone which is called osteogenesis so broadly we have endochondral bone formation and intramembranous bone formation so your endochondral bone formation is where your cartilage comes first which is later on replaced by bone which happens in the areas which are more prone to compression that means your condylar cartilage at the condylar region of the mandible the coronoid region and the median region the symphysis region where endochondral bone formation takes place rest of the area is more prone to tension in the nasomaxillary complex and hence your entire maxilla and rest of the mandible is actually being formed by intramembranous bone formation where there is no replacement by any cartilage but it is a direct formation of bone from mesial chimeric tissue so next we see the video for intramembranous bone formation Hello, my name, my name is Bruce Plozer, and, and this animation is demonstrating the biological process of intramembranous ossification. During fetal development, intramembranous ossification results in the formation of bones, specifically the flat bones of the skull, the mandible, and the clavicle. To begin, intramembranous ossification takes place in mesenchymal or fibrous connective tissue. In the connective tissue, mesenchymal stem cells come together or aggregate and then begin replicating. After sufficient replication, these mesenchymal cells begin differentiating, becoming bone-creating osteoblasts. These newly formed osteoblasts then release an uncalcified bone matrix known as osteoid. The osteoid is then calcified with the addition of calcium salts and other minerals. The enzyme alkaline phosphatase acts as a catalyst in this process. As the animation portrays, osteoblasts, when surrounded by calcified bone matrix, can differentiate further into osteocytes, which house themselves in hollowed out living spaces called lacunae. These cells support the bone in maturity. This first process is known generally as ossification, and where ossification takes place is known as an ossification center. As intramembranous ossification continues, osseous branches, known as spicules, are formed. These spicules will eventually touch one another and fuse together, forming a larger piece. Seeing as mature bone is highly vascular, spicules will grow themselves around blood vessels. This also allows for increased nutrient and waste exchange during these crucial developmental stages. The initial bone formed from intramembranous ossification is known as spongy bone due to its sponge-like appearance. Through the process of bone remodeling, the osteocytes at the edge of spongy bone can reorganize themselves into tightly packed bundles known as osteons. These osteons are the foundational building blocks of compact bone, which is then formed on the outside edges of the spongy bone. This layering of compact bone, spongy bone, and compact bone again is the defining characteristics of bones categorized as flat bones. Through a different process of bone remodeling, the middle layer of spongy bone can be removed, creating a medullary cavity. The final structure of completed bones is the outermost layer of connective tissue known as the periosteum. The innermost portion of the periosteum is composed of fibrous connective tissue. In this tissue, more osteoblasts can be produced, allowing for the bone to grow in width. This is known as apositional growth. In review, we began with mesenchymal stem cells, which, after replicating, differentiated into osteoblasts. The osteoblasts then released an uncalcified bone matrix, and after the matrix was calcified, they differentiated again into osteocytes. The initial bone created by this process is spongy bone, which can then be remodeled into compact bone. Examples of bones created through intramembranous ossification are the flat bones of the skull, the mandible, and the clavicle. This can okay, so next we see a video for endochondral bone formation.
During embryonic development, cells called chondroblasts begin secreting cartilage that develops in the shape of the skeleton's long bones. The bluish, transparent avascular tissue formed is called hyaline cartilage. As the cartilage grows, the chondroblasts in the interior calcify and die. Blood vessels penetrate the structure and deliver osteoblasts. These cells lay down bone material. As the cartilage ossifies in spongy bone forms, a medullary cavity develops. At the ends of a long bone, ossification from cartilage also occurs. This process, in which hyaline cartilage becomes bone and grows, is called endochondral ossification. Bone growth continues through childhood. After puberty, bone tissue replaces the remaining hyaline cartilage, and the shaft reaches its adult length. Okay, so next is a short recap video for all of you to go through your embryology and the part which has already been covered in the previous lecture because this is in continuation with that. So let's start. The facial features of the human embryo develop rapidly very early on in pregnancy, beginning around the fourth week after conception. Many of the structures of the face originate from a group of cells called cranial neural crest cells. These cells move in a distinct pattern from the neural tube located in the back of the embryo to create the various structures of the face. Aberrations in the formation or behavior of these cells are the main causes of abnormalities in the head and face. During the first three days of development, the fertilized ovum, or egg, is located in the fallopian tube. As it travels down the tube, it undergoes rapid divisions to form a cluster of cells called the morula. These cells then organize themselves to form the blastocyst, and by the end of week five, the fully formed blastocyst comes into contact with the uterine wall for implantation. During the second week of development, the inside of the blastocyst, known as the embryoblast, becomes two layers, the hypoblast and the epiblast layers. Together, these layers form an oval-shaped disc-like structure. In the third week of development, a streak is created on the surface of the epiblast, during which time the cells of the epiblast detach and migrate. These migrating cells create three layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm layers, which go on to contribute cells to form all the tissues and organs in the human body. In the third to fourth weeks of development, a cord called the notochord is formed. This induces the cells in the overlying ectoderm to thicken, forming a region called the neural plate along the back of the embryo. The edges of the neural plate elevate to form the neural folds that eventually fuse to form the neural tube. During this process, neural crest cells are formed along the entire length of the tube at the tip of the folding neural folds. Neural crest cells formed from the head or cranial region are called cranial neural crest cells, or CNCCs. These cells multiply and soon start migrating over long distances in distinct paths from the back of the embryo towards the front of the embryo. Once they arrive at their target destinations in the facial regions, CNCCs further develop and mature and ultimately contribute to a substantial amount of the structures in the head and neck region, such as bones, cartilage, and nerves. Growth, migration, and subsequent differentiation of CNCCs are critically important for proper development of the normal structures of the facial region. Soon after the CNCCs reach their final destination, the facial structures begin to take shape externally. By the fourth week of development, the embryo is characterized by five facial swellings, the frontonasal prominence and the paired maxillary and mandibular prominences. These structures are formed in part from the migration and proliferation of the CNCCs from different regions of the neural tube. In a five-week-old embryo, the nasal placodes, which will go on to become the olfactory system, and the optic placodes, which will become the lenses of the eyes, will form. In addition, the maxillary and mandibular prominences enlarge and grow forward and towards the middle, eventually giving rise to the upper and lower jaws, respectively. In a six-week-old embryo, the two mandibular prominences fuse to form the lower jaw. At this point, the outline of the mouth is visible. In the seven-week-old embryo, the maxillary prominences grow and fuse to form the border of the nostril and the upper lip. Merging of the maxillary and mandibular prominences forms the cheeks and the corners of the mouth. The filtrum of the upper lip and palate are also created at this time. 
In this flurry of activity in the first seven weeks after fertilization, the five facial prominences give rise to the formation of the forehead and sides of the face, middle and sides of the nose, the philtrum, the upper lip, the palate, and the lower jaw. By the seventh week of human embryonic development, most of the facial structures can be observed. In the next few months of development, the initial cartilaginous skeleton of the face is replaced by bone, and there is an overall increase in shape and size of the different structures of the face. From childhood to adulthood, the face continues to develop through further growth and remodeling. Okay, so we are back on the formation of five brinkle arches which are there and we are going to concentrate on the first one that is the mandibular arch which is leading to formation of our maxilla and mandible and our maxilla has already been formed in the previous lecture so we are going to concentrate on mandible now. So if you see carefully you have a Meckel's cartilage which is occupying this first brinkle arch or the mandibular arch okay and then rest you have second, third and fourth but we are not bothered about that right now. So the question which should come into your mind is about this Meckel's cartilage. Is it a waste cartilage or does it really form the mandible? So here we have the answer in the form of another video which will follow this. So if you look at this picture, this gives you a clue. Your Meckel's cartilage is actually a template for your mandible, but it is not really forming the mandible as such. What it really forms is it forms a template and at its proximal end in the midline it is going to give rise to some cartilage residues in the midline and over here it enters the middle ear and gives rise to your malleus and incus that means your middle ear bones and also your sphenomandibular ligament okay rest of it is going to degenerate so let's see how it actually helps in forming a template for your entire mandibular formation in the form of the video Development of the mandible. In humans, Meckel's cartilage has a close positional relationship to the developing mandible, but it makes no contribution to it. At six weeks of development, this cartilage extends as a solid hyaline cartilaginous rod surrounded by a fibrocellular cartilage. It extends from the developing ear region to the midline of the merged mandibular processes. The cartilage from each side does not meet at the midline. They are separated by a thin band of ectomesenchyme. The mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is the nerve of the first arch, has a close relationship to Meckel's cartilage. It begins two-thirds of the way along the length of the cartilage, at this point, the mandibular nerve divides into the lingual and the inferior alveolar branches, which run along the medial and lateral aspects of the cartilage, respectively. The inferior alveolar nerve further divides into the incisor and mental branches anteriorly. During the sixth week of embryonic development, on the lateral aspect of Meckel's cartilage, a condensation of ectomesenchyme occurs in the angle formed by the division of the inferior alveolar and its incisal and mental branches. At seven weeks, intramembranous ossification begins in this area of condensation, hence forming the first bone of the mandible via intramembranous ossification. So if you see, the entire mandible is actually being formed by intramembranous ossification apart from three areas, your condylar region, coronoid and the midline. By 10 weeks, the rudimentary mandible is formed almost entirely by intramembranous ossification with little or no direct involvement of Meckel's cartilage. So your Meckel's cartilage is actually going to degenerate and it will contribute to a malleus, incus and spinomandibular ligament and in the middle line some part of cartilage which will be left in the mandible. Otherwise it has not contributed in the mandible's body per se. 
Further growth of the mandible until birth is strongly influenced by the appearance of three secondary or growth cartilages and the development of muscular attachments. So at three points, these three points you are having endochondral bone formation with these secondary cartilages being formed first which are going to be replaced by your bones thereafter. However, not completely in the region of condyle because a layer of condylar cartilage is going to persist lifelong owing to the compression to which it is exposed to. So if you look at the condylar process, what really happens is initially at fifth week, it develops as a separate endo-ectomesenchymal tissue over here away from the mandible. Then it forms cone shape and fuses with the mandible at 10th week of intrauterine life following which most of the cartilage will be replaced by intramembranous bone however a cap of a cartilage would still remain and it will stay there lifelong so next the baby is born and we're going to talk about the postnatal growth of mandible so we start with the mandible as such so if you see the alveolar process and actually the entire mandible you have deposition posteriorly okay you have deposition at the inferior border of the mandible in the chin also you have Deposition below, resorption above, if you see it is just making the chin prominent with age. And on the height of your alveolar process, again there is positive signs, means there is increase in the height of your alveolar process, which is actually in line with your functional matrix theory. That means it is dependent on your teeth. As the teeth come, the function is there, your uh, periosteal matrix is active then your bone is going to grow if the teeth are gone with age then the bone will also resolve so if you see everywhere there are positive signs except the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible now this anterior border there is a resorption to compensate for the erupting posterior teeth the molars Okay, so there is a reason for that. Apart from that, there is deposition everywhere else. Here you see this resorption making the chin more prominent. So if we concentrate on the coronoid process of the mandible, it is growing in the form of V. So this is in line with our n lowers V principle, functional uh, theories, growth theories. So this is how it is growing with deposition mostly and inside endosteally there's going to be resorption to make sure that the width of the bone is maintained if you look at this carefully you have your condyle you have your coronoid process and there is a twisted contour of the coronoid process with laterally resorption being present and medially inside you have deposition happening which is making that ridge very very prominent and if you look at the sigmoid notch and the coronoid together it is all growing posteriorly in direction entire thing growing like a V and if you look at the mandible carefully yellow being a fetal mandible and green being the adult one there is a typical ramus to corpus remodeling conversion taking place that means this is the corpus or the body of the mandible. This is the ramus of the mandible. So if you look at the yellow one, this is your ramus of the fetal mandible. And it is actually becoming a part of the body of your green or the adult mandible with time. Also, there is another phenomenon happening which is called as ramus uprighting. So if you look at the typical patterns of deposition happening in the condylar region upward and also in the coronoid region upward with a slight angulation, you have slight resorption posteriorly, deposition and little resorption towards the inferior border leading to the change in the inclination or the uprighting of the ramus in the following way. Okay, so if you concentrate, there is bone deposition there and over here. So that's how your ramus actually moves with age. Of course, anteriorly there is resorption for making space for the erupting molars. So that's your ramus uprighting, which actually defines your morphology of the mandible and how your face will grow because your inclination of the ramus in the body is going to change here so it will depend whether your face will start growing vertically down if your ramus and the 
body start deviating too much from each other or whether it will continue to grow forward and horizontally more. So in this case there is something which is called as an antigonal notch which starts to appear depending upon how much ramus uprighting is taking place for you. So this is the separation of your corpus and the ramus and a typical notch which appears over there is termed as antigonal notch. Okay, so there are two categories which can happen over here. So this is one where your ramus uprighting is appropriately taking place and hence the change in inclination of your ramus and corpus is not much and hence your antigonal notch will not be very much prominent. Whereas the second category will be where both of them are growing vertically away from each other. So you see the vertical inclination of the body of the mandible and you have a deep antigonal notch happening over there. Next we move on to lingual tuberosity on the lingual aspect of the mandible again growing posteriorly and if you look at it carefully so that's your deposition on top and resorption below making the shape the way it is just making it prominent with time and your gonial angle is just going to flare with age away from each other widen and widen. Now condyle is something which is very very interesting so that's your typical condyle your temporal bone condyle you have a meniscus in between and we are going to concentrate on how this entire condylar structure is growing downward and forward it is dragging the mandible down and forward and the entire face grows in that direction and remember this condylocartilage is going to persist lifelong because it's a pressure adapted region endochondral bone formation is taking place there. Okay, so you have this cartilage cap which will stay there lifelong, rest of the cartilage has been replaced slowly with your intramembranous bone formation. However, this capping will stay there forever. So this often makes us feel that there are two ways this entire condyle or the mandible is growing. One is since there is actually an active growth site or cartilage still present there lifelong so probably it is actively pushing against our cranial base of the temporal bone and making the entire mandible or the face grow down and forward. Second is that with time since the entire face is growing in the soft tissue around it is growing it is dragging the mandible along with it. Remember functional matrix theory so the functioning space is growing the soft tissue and everything is dragging the mandible forward and then to compensate for the gap which gets created between the temporal bone and the condyle there is going to be bone deposition there and the condyle will respond and grow posteriorly. So we more or less believe in the second one more that is the functional matrix theory which says that it is the enlarging soft tissue which is dragging the mandible protrusively and then in response to that the condyle and the ramus remodels to close the gap. So next we move on to a very very interesting section. So if you look at this picture we have some uh, actors which I have put in there and now look at each one of them carefully. Yes, second one and the third one. So that's the development of your chin that makes the difference, right? Remember chin is something which is very peculiar to human beings. It's only present in human beings and it is supposed to be more prominent in males and less prominent in females. So let's see what makes the chin more prominent. So that's where your chin is, your symphysis. So we concentrate completely on the remodeling which is making it much more prominent with age. So you're going to have this typical shape which will make it more prominent. So we want more resorption here and more deposition here which will make it more prominent. So what should be the signs we should put? Negative outside, that means positive inside because we want to maintain the width of the bone and here we want more bone being added. So we want positive signs there, okay? So now we go on to the application of mandible relation to various growth theories. So we start with functional matrix theory just for a recap it just tells you that your function is guiding the shape of the and the shape and the size of the bone just like this particular animal which has got shot such sharp canines because of to enable the function of tearing similarly there has been evolution of the human palate from you to a parabola to follow the function of speech now we go on to our mandible. So if you look at the mandible, there it's one macroskeletal according to the functional matrix theory and it can be split into various microskeletals, your condyle, ramus, 
angle, coronoid process and the body and your alveolar process here. So coming to the applied part, what we do as an orthopedic, uh, when we are dealing with the bones, so there is a patient suppose who is class 2. By class 2 I mean class 2 skeletal means mandible is behind, it is retronathic and I want to grow the mandible. So I am going to exploit the functional matrix theory to do that. So I am going to make a functional appliance and give to the patient expecting the patient's mandible will grow and patient will become class 1 with time. So I give that appliance to the, to the patient in, in a way that patient is forced to bite in a forward position. Okay, so I do like this. So with this what is happening a translative growth is happening which is leading to a change in position of the mandible and the capsular matrix. That means I am stretching the orofacial tissue all the muscles everything around the mandible is being stretched and according to functional matrix theory this should lead to a change in local periosteal matrices over here and there should be remodeling because of the soft tissue which has been stretched here lateral pterygoid muscle so there will be bone deposition resorption over here in response to this translative change so with time the mandible will actually grow and compensate for this gap which I have created with my functional appliance and thus the patient's mandible will grow and patient will become class 1 skeletal base with an orthomatic orthonathic mandible from a retronathic mandible in class 2. So that's how we correct skeletal problems with our functional appliances using functional matrix theory and we cause a transformative growth changing the shape and size by causing local changes in periosteal matrices. So next is our V principle in the mandible. So we know just like the maxilla, the palate which was growing in the shape of a V, our mandible also is growing in the shape of a V. So this is how you can compare from young age to adult. The shape of the growth of mandible is typically in an expanding V principle which is widening with age. So next we move on to the counterpart principle in the mandible. So remember it says that these are certain structures which are going as counterpart with each other. That means your anterior cranial fossa, maxilla and the body of the mandible and your middle cranial fossa, pharynx and the ramus of the mandible. So they are all counterpart with each other. So there has to be a balance between an equilibrium which needs to be maintained amongst them. If there is a disturbance in growth in any one part then the adjacent structure will also be hampered. So moving on to the applied aspect. So whenever there is a case of a forcep delivery where we are holding the child during the delivery and the, the forcep tends to hinder the uh, injure the condyle and the condylar cartilage gets hampered then this is what happens TMG and kylosis that means the entire mandible fails to grow because the cartilage has, cartilage has been disrupted so no functional matrix theory no function and hence no growth of the mandible at all so that one side of the mandible does not grow at all okay so if the mandible doesn't grow this side the entire mandible is shifted to the side of the ankylosis secondly the entire face shape is being guided by your growth and development of the mandible. So if you look at this picture and this picture, there is a difference. You look at this picture, this is a typical broad face individual. Why? This has happened because of the muscles. So if you have strong musculature, your face becomes broad. Concentrate on the mandible what has happened because there is a strong uprighting of the ramus which has happened over here mandibular ramus and body are all upright and the body has not been allowed to go down and back or vertically in any down way the ramus uprighting has been really strong because of strong masticatory musculature so the entire mandible is expressing its growth, growth horizontally more rather than vertically down however if your muscles are loose the muscles of mastication the mandible is not being kept tight up and the mandible goes down swinging down so you have a strong antigonal notch over here and the ramus uprighting is less and you have a typical long face and you develop a dolico facial appearance so your face form actually tells me about your muscles of mastication it tells me the way your mandible is growing this one the mandible is growing more horizontally in front it is up whereas this one the mandible is growing vertically down and these patients will also have an open bite or a shallow bite whereas these ones with brachiofacial ones will be 
having a increased overbite so your muscles are guiding your overbite your skeletal basis growth pattern and whatnot and how will it affect us in orthodontics so we can actually appreciate the condyla shape also even the condyle shape is different in a horizontal grower or brachyfacial individuals your condyle is upright whereas in the long face individuals with loose musculature your condyle is backwardly inclined and of course there is a difference in your lower border with a deep anti-gonial notch in the vertical growth patterns, high clinical FMA or long face or dolicofacial individuals with loose musculature. So as orthodontists, what we have to do is, remember this is called your clinical FMA. That means it's the angle between your Frankfurt horizontal plane from your ear to the orbitale. That means the lower border of the orbit. And this line is from your lower border of the mandible. This angle is called your, it should ideally, this is your mandibular plane angle, which should ideally be about 25 degrees. So if your angle is more than this, we say you are high clinical FMA or you're growing vertically, you are towards dolicofacial and you, you tend to have a long face. That means you have loose musculature, okay? If your angle, angle is lesser than this, then we believe you are brachyfacial, broad face with your horizontally growing mandible which is growing up and you have a very strong musculature that you're not letting the mandible grow down and backward. And if you have the right balance of both, then you are an average growth pattern individual whose angle, your angle between Frankfurt horizontal plane and the mandibular plane is typically 25 degrees. So as an orthodontist, our job is to maintain your clinical FMA and we do not want it to be hampered. Now the problem or the drawback of orthodontics is invariably the orthodontics, that means braces treatment will cause an extrusion of molar teeth. That means your molars will come out of the socket and the drawback of that is if your molars come out of the socket with treatment, then your entire mandible swings down and back further. That means your clinical FMA, Frankfurt mandibular plane angle, will increase further. So that might make, make your uh, face look longer, which might not be aesthetic, and even shallow your bite. That means your overbite might be turn into an open bite, which will not be a good idea unless you want it in certain cases where deep bite is present. So our idea is to use this philosophy to our benefit, whether we want the posteriors to extrude and the bite to open up while the mandible is swinging down and backward, or whether we want that to not happen at all. So we have to evaluate the growth pattern of an individual and then plan our treatment accordingly. And thus, when... If all occurs in perfect timing, the journey ends with nature's greatest design, a beautiful face. So thank you everybody. Be ready for a short quiz following this lecture. So stay safe and happy reading.